good. I mean, I, I, if I go to a store and they want to wear it, I wear it, okay? If I see the majority of people wear them, all right, I'll wear it. You know what I'm saying? I'm not going to compliment them, but I'm not going to be. If I don't have to. Okay, we're all set, Jen. Good morning and welcome to the annual meeting of FMB Hartford Bank Corp. My name is Tim Perman. I'm president and CEO of Forte Bank and president of FMB uh, Hartford Bank Corp. I'm happy to welcome all of you as shareholders this morning. We have shareholders joining us both in person and via Zoom webinar. Um, at the onset of today's meeting, we would just like to provide some information to shareholders who are present via Zoom, and I'm gonna call on the Chief Risk Officer of the bank, Jennifer Johnson, to go through specific details with regards to participation through Zoom. Jennifer? Thank you, Tim. Um, thank you to those of you who are participating via Zoom. I see I have about nine of you that are logged in this morning. Um, just a reminder that if you would like to ask a question, there's a Q&A function near the, if you move your mouse, you should have some options at the bottom of your screen that will allow you to select Q&A and submit a question. You can choose to submit the question to me and I will uh, relay the question to the speaker, whether it be Lori, Tim, or Dennis, um, and we'll address your question um, throughout the presentation. So feel free to ask at any time and then we'll address them as we go through the presentation. Um, there is also uh, a chat functionality where you can choose to chat, but there's really no difference, Q&A or chat, whichever way you'd like to communicate with us. A reminder that you um, can make a motion through the chat or the Q&A, uh, however you cannot vote through one of those two options. Um, if you do have any questions, like I said, please submit them. Um, with that, we will be recording the session too if you have any technical difficulties. So, thank okay. you. Thank you very much, Jennifer. Um, we hope that uh, participation via Zoom will be beneficial to those who are joining us in that fashion. At this time, I would like to introduce uh, Chairman of FMB Hartford Bank Corp, Dennis Carroll, to uh, facilitate our meeting today. Dennis? During these unusual times, and we're experiencing them both personally and corporately, it has been most common for me to uh, issue a uh, good evening. This is the first time in the history of my bank banking that I'm uh, going to say good morning. <laughs> good morning, everyone, and welcome to the um, F&B annual meeting. The first order of business, um, I'll call the meeting to order, and we need an election of both a chairman and a secretary. Do we have a nomination for a chairman and a secretary, please? Mr. Chairman, I'll make a motion to elect Dennis Carroll as chairman and Lori Hilder as secretary of this meeting. It's been moved to elect Dennis Carroll and Lori Hilger, uh, chairman and secretary respectively. Is there a second to that motion? I'll second. Tom Mayaki second it. <coughs> All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? None of the contrary. Motion carried. <coughs> in accordance, um, with the, the uh, bylaws of the corporation, uh, I'd like to uh, establish uh, some uh, uh, compliance requirements for this meeting. <clears throat> the bylaws call for a majority of the outstanding shares of the corporation to vote, either represented in person or by proxy, and that shall constitute a quorum of a meeting of the shareholders and make it legitimate. As of Tuesday, July 21st, this year at 5 p.m., the corporation had received enough proxies, 364,714 of the 435,952 shares outstanding. This represents 83.6% of the shares by proxy. So as such, I will declare that uh, sufficient shares are represented in person or by proxy to properly conduct this meeting. With that, I'll call upon Lori Hilger uh, to read uh, the minutes of uh, the 19 annual meeting. Lori. Good morning. Good morning. morning. F&B Hartford Bank Corp Inc. annual meeting minutes, March 27th, 2019. Chairman of the board, Dennis Carroll, called the annual meeting of the F&B Hartford Bank Corp Inc. to order at 7 p.m. on Wednesday, March 27, 2019. 
The first order of business was to elect a chairman and secretary for the meeting. Thomas Levin made a motion. Dennis Carroll act as chairman and Lori Hilger act as secretary, seconded by Doug Carroll, motion carried. Chairman Carroll requested a roll call of shareholders of the holding company of record as of January 31st, 2019. Total shares outstanding were 435,952, of which 388,160 being represented by proxy, with 200 being represented in person and 47,592 absent. Chairman Carroll informed the shareholders that a sufficient number of shares were represented in order to conduct the annual meeting in compliance with the corporation's bylaws. Lori Hilger read the minutes of the March 28th, 2018 annual meeting. There being no additions or corrections, Kurt Conkle made a motion to approve the motion, mean, to approve the minutes as read. Joseph Oleski seconded the motion, motion carry. Lori Hilger presented the following 2018 FNB Hartford Bank Corp Inc reports the year-end balance sheet, income and expense statement, and reserve accounts. A motion to approve the reports as presented was made by Margaret Smith, seconded by Anthony Preskin. Motion carried. The Board of Directors, having placed into nomination the following Class II directors, Timothy Perman, Mark Hauser, and Kenneth Reiser. The next order of business was voting on the directors in nomination. President Timothy Perman, addressed the stockholders in attendance at the meeting. He reported to the shareholders on the following. Five-year growth trend of net income, five-year growth trend in return on assets in comparison to our peer, five-year growth trend of earnings per share, F&B Hartford Bancorp Inc. five-year stock valuation in comparison to book value, five-year growth trends of deposits and loans, product enhancements and additions to the retail and commercial areas of the bank, five-year positive trend in non-performing assets to total assets ratio, five-year trend of net charge-offs to average loans, five-year trend of the Texas ratio, strategic priorities, growth and profitability improvement, including market expansion, maintain a strong service culture, employee professional development and talent acquisition, efficiency, speeding up product delivery and reducing the cost of revenue generation, sales of products and services, create a selling culture that complements our service culture, shareholder value, reasonable return on investment when compared to other investment alternatives with commensurate risk. The 2018 return on investment was 6.98%. Provide reasonable liquidity under normal economic conditions. We strive to be the best bank you could choose to do business with. We want to be a good corporate citizen and promote economic growth in the communities we serve. Chairman Dennis Carroll appointed Lori Mim as ballot clerk. Ballots were cast and tabulated with the following results. To elect the class two directors, votes for the three nominees. 382,290. Withholding authority to vote for the three nominees, zero. Withholding authority to vote for individual nominees, 6,070. Chairman Dennis Carroll reported that based on the voting results, the three class three directors, Timothy Perman, Mark Hauser, and Kenneth Reiser have been elected to three year terms. Kenneth Reiser made a motion for the same proxy arrangement for the next annual meeting. Mark Hauser seconded the motion. Motion carried. Other business? None. There being no other further business, Thomas Lapine made a motion seconded by Fred Pfeiffer to adjourn. Motion carried. Meeting adjourned at 7.42 p.m. You can stay close here, Lori. Okay, I will. <laughs> You've all heard uh, the reading of the minutes of the 2019 annual meeting. Are there uh, any additions or corrections to those minutes? There being none, I would entertain a motion for approval. Move. Moved by Scott Lopez to approve the minutes of the 2019 meeting. Is there a second to that motion? I'll second. Rochelle Preskin seconds that motion. All in favor? 
Opposed? None to the contrary. Motion carried. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. At this time, uh, we'll call Lori back up here and uh, she'll uh, present the uh, financials. I'm just going to go through the basics, um, the highlights of the financials, and Tim will go into greater depth in his presentation. I'm in, if you're following along in your annual report, I am on page two in the balance sheet. The biggest highlight, our total assets grew to $236,866,788 at the end of the year, 13.62% as compared to at the end of 2018, 208,465,414. Fed funds sold increased over 1,000% ending the year at 10,722,000. Investments ended the year slightly down 7.86% at $34,213,112. Loans increased 12.5% to $168,516,858. Deposits increased 13.6% to $206,552,493. Moving on to the income statement on page three of your annual report. Interest income, interest on investments in decreased 1.68% to earn us $954,721. Loan interest income increased 21.9% to $8,013,516, excuse me, $568. Totaling to total interest income increased 18.18% to $8,968,289. Interest expense, interest on deposits was $1,072,256, an increase of 92.97%. Interest on borrowings increased 70, to $75,442, an increase of $6,043.49. We had literally no borrowings in 2018. So total interest expense ended the year at $1,147,698 as compared to 2018, $556,882, an increase of 106%, 106.9%. The provision on loan loss we increased it $15,000 to $165,000 total, an increase of 17.86%. Non-interest income, service charges on deposit accounts totaled $368,715, an increase of 1.23%. Investments, investment service fees, we earned $317,192, a decrease of 11%. A gain on sales of loans to the secondary market increased. We earned 146% increase, totaling $340,527. Other non-interest income relatively unchanged at $506,980. Total non-interest income $1,533,414, an increase of 11.6%. On to non-interest income, the salaries and benefits increased 5.99%, totaling $4,083,931. Computer services increased 6.41%, totaling $846,022. Other real estate valuation allowance was $93,000, um, a decrease of 33.47%. The current book value of all of the bank's other real estate is now zero. All other expenses, uh, $1,795,231, an increase of 16, excuse me, 0.16%. Bringing the bank to net income of 
$879, an increase of 37.65%. Total net income, our net income before taxes, $2,370,821, an increase of 41.23%. Income taxes increased 55.56%, totaling $522,942. Net income, I already went through that, $1,847,879 last year. Are there any questions? Thank you, okay. Thank you Lori. My pleasure. Thank you. Uh, Tim Furman will then now give uh, uh, the management report for uh, the year 2020. Did you by chance notice the amount of taxes that we pay to uh, various agencies, state and federal? Just a reminder, credit unions don't pay a single buck. <laughs> okay, thank you, Lori, and thank you, Dennis. Um, uh, just a couple of brief comments I want to say, and then I'm going to go through some slide presentations um, with the shareholders in attendance this morning. Um, very, very complimentary of the Forte Bank team. Um, last year, as noted by the asset growth of the bank, as well as net income growth, um, those, uh, those performance metrics were outstanding. Um, at the same time, the team navigated significant changes with regards to products and services, uh, principally on the uh, electronic um, side of the equation, enhancing uh, online banking, mobile banking, and card debit card services, and also the significant uh, amount of energy and effort that was required uh, to convert uh, from a nationally bank, a nationally chartered bank, to a state chartered bank, and going through uh, the prerequisites of that, as well as communicating the name change with both U.S. shareholders and our customers. And I have to say that um, that process went extremely well. Um, our customers have adapted to that change. Um, we are uh, continuing to grow uh, immensely through the, balance, through the first part of 2020. And so I have to say that that transition has been um, absolutely outstanding. And my compliments again to the entire Forte Bank team for a strong performance in 2019 and continued effort this year. Um, the slides that I'd like to share with you, um, I believe will be uh, uh, broadcast here in the office as well as on Zoom, and I will begin to go through those. So the first presentation is with regards to um, asset and liability growth. This is a compilation of the last five years historical performance of the bank from growth loans to deposits. Um, specifically last year, as Lori highlighted in our financial report, um, deposits increased 13% uh, um, uh, and loans, um, excuse me, loans increased 13% and deposits increased 12%. This is gross loans. Uh, by comparison, our local peer group um, did not grow as high as that and actually total asset growth for the bank was 13.2, 13.62% as highlighted in Lori's uh, financial report compared to peer group at about six local peer group and national peer group at 5.9%. So we were almost double the growth um, in both deposits and assets and, uh, and loans compared to our peer groups last year. In terms of asset quality, our asset quality remains outstanding. I mean, the superior end of performance among peers, um, non-performing assets, the total assets was just five basis points compared to 62 basis points, or 0.62% of 1% last year. This has been a continuing trend downward for the entire financial industry. Um, we have consistently over the last five years performed better than our peer groups as it relates to non-performing assets to total assets. By the same token, um, net charge-offs to average loans um, last year, we had a negative uh, net charge off, which would indicate that the bank actually had recovery of loans and those recoveries were associated with the charges that were taken in 2018. Um, again, historically, the trend line shows, however, that our bank, Forte Bank, over the last five years has performed better than our peer group with regards to net charge offs. Um, and again, in 2019, we began to receive some recovery 
for the charges that we took in 2018. So the next slide is the uh, Texas ratio and by definition, what this is is non-current loans plus debt securities plus other real estate owned divided by the tangible equity of the corporation plus its loan loss reserves. Um, the, the trend line here is, is in concert with the first slide that um, we presented, which indicated non-performing assets or non-performing loans to total lo assets. Um, again, significantly below peer group at 41 basis points compared to 5.31% for our, um, our peer group. Uh, the next slide um, will indicate uh, consolidated net income for the corporation. Again, a 37% increase over 2018. Um, the, the trend prior to that was st fairly stable. Um, this growth took place as a result of expanded lending activity um, and a higher return on total assets. So again, 37% increase in net income over the previous year which is superior performance. Return on assets, uh, last year we were at 83 basis points compared to 96 basis points. As you can see, the trend line um, would indicate that um, we were holding again steady in that, I'll call it 75 basis point range. Um, we had a little bit of a, a, a blip in 2018, but we narrowed the gap in 2019 uh, we improved uh, return on average assets by 17 basis points in one year, which uh, is, again is outstanding and we're narrowing the gap compared to our peer group as well. Um, the next uh, uh, information I'll share with you, which is in regards to equity and shareholder value. Our earnings per share last year were $4.24. Um, an increase of, uh, again, 37.6%. Our targeted payout on dividends um, uh, and, and act is 30% in last year. Our actual payout on dividends was 25.9%. Return on equity. Um, last year, our return was 7.23%, which was the highest return in the five-year um, reporting period that I'm uh, comparing with you here. Um, Again, uh, that is as well computed against a 11.1% tier one capital ratio, which compared to our peer group, the average ratio of capital was 10.02%. Um, so 7.24% return on equity, um, given the strength of the asset values of the bank and the equity that we have um, is improving and it's reasonable compared to the risk associated with an investment in FMB, Hartford Bank Corp, and other investments that may be available out there. Our target um, is 8% uh, return on equity. The next uh, uh, um, slide will indicate uh, stock values. Um, 2019 book value was $60 per share. Um, we do have our stock evaluated on an annualized basis by an external third party. Um, that firm last year came up with a valuation as of December 31st of $67.45. So if you're marking that for your own personal financial statements, the current market value should be pegged at 67.45. Um, the next uh, information that I would like to uh, share with you are details with regards to the conversion from a national bank to a state bank. Um, we've been evaluating the conversion of our charter for a number of years. Um, we highlight the benefits of what that conversion would mean um, and I'll share those with you. The first is an expanded lending authority uh, as a national bank um, authorization for individual borrowings to uh, is 15% of capital to a single borrower that is expanded to 20% as a state bank of capital. Um, I did not add this to the slide, but if you were to take just a nominal um, uh, evaluation of borrowers that have, would have been reaching the bank's legal lending limit and only took about a, uh, one half of 1% of those total borrowers that we have and 
actually expanded the legal lending limit for those borrowers retaining more dollars here at the bank as opposed to having to participate loans outside of the bank. An estimate would be about $150,000 of annual additional revenue based on the ability to retain uh, more dollars in our own loan portfolio as a hat, opposed to participating those to other banks. Um, cost savings in 2018, we paid $77,000 in assessment fees to the comptroller of the currency. By contrast, as a state bank, um, we pay an annual assessment to the Wisconsin Department of Financial Institution. That coupled with the, the build services for doing an examination equated to about $20,000 in annualized oversight fees. So there's again a, a recognition of about $50,000 annually in savings just on assessments um, for regulatory oversight. Um, and again, federal bank, federally chartered banks, um, uh, again, are regulated by the OCC or the Federal Reserve Bank. State banks are regulated by the State Department of Financial Institutions and the FDIC. Our cost of FDIC oversight and examination is built into the cost that we have always been paying um, with FDIC insurance deposit premiums um, on an annualized basis. Another consideration was regulatory and line alignment. My research indicated that eight of the 10 largest banks in the United States were nationally chartered banks. Um, as such, it's my belief that the regulatory regime or the, the regulatory environment for all banks that are national banks are extremely um, onerous, particularly those to community banks. And so the majority of state banks or community banks are chartered as state banks. And that, F, that, OC, the, that regulatory oversight is provided by the FDIC and is my belief that it aligned more with the nature of operations of community banks. So from a regulatory standpoint, I believe that the, reg the change from a nationally bank uh, charter bank to a state bank chartered and regulation by the FDIC as opposed to the OCC more aligns with our who we are as an organization. Um, this change necessitated, or this uh, change in, in charter also ne necessitated a name change um, only national banks or those uh, chartered as national banks and regulated by the OCC can have the word national in their name. Thus that, that necessitated the name change to Forte Bank. Um, then continuing a little bit more discussion with regards to the conversion. Um, an evaluation of the cost of conversion are outlined in this next slide. Um, we incurred just over $26,000 in legal fees. Uh, Rebranding costs, uh, signage were just over 58,000. Um, uh, system modifications, which included um, changes to our loan and deposit documentation systems, online and mobile banking systems, and website uh, changes um, amounted to a little over 16,000. Uh, marketing, design, um, sharing of the news, uh, providing uh, both shareholders and customers with the benefits of being a state chartered bank um, and um, announcing the branding and the name change amounted to just over 25,000. And we did some promotion at just under 20,000 and we had a reset on some of our supplies to convert from First National Bank to Forte Bank. That cost over just over $6,000. So the total cost um, was up just over $150,000. And we capitalized 44,400 of that um, total cost in signage. Um, we had two of our uh, branch locations that actually needed facade improvement and the signage was not really up to par with what I would say would be commensurate with a, a, a quality bank today. We made those improvements as well as we did some um, improvements to uh, doing lighted directional signage at some of our branches. So those were changes that were necessary regardless of whether or not we would have gone through a charter and a name change. Again, the total cost of signage was 58,000 and we capitalized 44. The remainder of that approximately 106,000 we expensed all of last year, we wrote that off. And so that is all reflective and still the bank reported $1.8 million in net income and a 37% um, 
increase. So overall, I believe that from a financial standpoint, as well as from a branding standpoint, the conversion from a state to a, a national to a state bank charter and the name change has gone extremely well for the corporation. Looking forward to 2020, um, we still have high expectations for performance improvement. Um, just sharing here some highlights of that. These are pretty much consistent with the goals that we established for 2019, but we expect uh, asset growth of 6%, loan growth of 10%, and deposit growth of 6%. Those are again our targets. Um, return on average assets of 80 basis points, return on average equity of 8%, and a targeted dividend payout ratio of 30%. Um, we we want to maintain our bank as a highly capitalized bank yet. Um, our tier one capital target is 11% and risk base of 14.5. Again, asset quality, non-performing assets, total loans, total non-performing loans to total loans of uh, 75 basis points at the high end and net charge offs of 10 basis points. So um, again, uh, just reiterating that uh, 2019 was a, a significant year in terms of change for the organization. I believe that the Forte Bank team navigated those changes extremely well. Um, uh, high performance as it relates to return on, uh, on assets and improvements in net income, significant asset growth. And I believe that uh, we um, did an, ex an exceptional job as a team last year in advancing the cause of community banking and Forte Bank. Um, so we'll uh, conclude my thoughts with that and we'll address any questions that might have come in or any questions from the floor. All right, thank you very much. <clears throat> thank you, Tim. As you can see, the staff and uh, all employees were extremely busy with not only the transition that went on, but uh, in the activity, uh, loan activity and, and everything else that goes with uh, community banking. Mr. So- Tim, We do have one question and I don't know if this is directed to Tim, Lori, or who would best like to answer it. But the question is, can you provide an update on 2020 to date? I turn it over to Tim. So, um, very good question. Um, lots of things have changed in our world um, since uh, March. Uh, uh, we did uh, close our lobby um, about the second week of March ba based on um, recommendations from the um, local uh, authorities with regards to the coronavirus pandemic. Um, we did transition a number of our customers from uh, lobby traffic to online banking or utilization of our, our, our uh, um, drive up facilities. Um, that has gone extremely well. Um, there's been good adaptation of those additional resources or uh, uh, means of accessing banking services. Um, and so that's gone well. We did open our lobbies back up on May 26th, I believe that was the day after Memorial Day. Traffic has been light within the lobbies, I would say. People are continuing to utilize online banking and, and drive up uh, banking services. And I would expect that that will continue um, for, for the balance pretty much of 2020. And obviously, it'll be interesting to see what happens in 2021. Um, from the perspective of business, um, uh, we've been extremely busy. I believe it was as of uh, June 30th, the total assets of the bank had grown to over 270 million um, from again, our year end 2019 of 239 million. So significant growth. Um, we did participate in the, um, the Paycheck Protection Program. We did about $16 million in advances in that program. And we have, uh, We've re we will receive significant income from that, uh, from that program. We have, uh, we've booked about 181,000 from that, um, as well as an, because of rate reductions that have taken place um, since uh, middle of March, we've had uh, significant growth in uh, the secondary market of refinance of mortgages. Um, 
I want to say that at this point, we're probably, we've already exceed revenue in that area from 2019 by approximately 40%. Um, some things that are of concern, however, is there, we're seeing margin compression as a result of significant uh, drops in the, the, uh, the overnight Fed target rate. Um, I don't anticipate seeing rate increases anytime in 2020 yet, and 2021 is still in question. So, so far this year, um, performance of the bank from both, both an income and a growth standpoint have been excellent. Um, and uh, the team has responded extremely well to um, the, the uh, adjustments that have needed to be made as it relates to the corona pandemic. So um, the bank continues to perform well as, again, because of those um, activities. And I think we're doing a good job so far in managing that. Yes, another question. Next question. Congratulations on a strong 2019 performance. What is the evolution to date in 2020 on the loan loss reserve and your prediction for the second half of 2020 in view of COVID and economic impacts? Okay, um, another great question. Um, we do believe that the, the, uh, the potential risks within lending have increased and we have increased our reserve for loss on loans uh, starting in, I believe it was April, our provision increased from a monthly provision of $15,000 to $65,000. Our provision right now in total compared to um, uh, net loans, I believe we're just over 1% in total reserve, but we're looking to continue to boost that up throughout the balance of this year. That's it for questions for right now. Okay. Uh, thank uh, the shareholders for the great questions and thanks for the uh, <clears throat> most appropriate answer there, Tim. <clears throat> the next order of business will be the election of the class three directors. The uh, following individuals were placed in the nomination by the board of directors, Al Laufer, Tom Ayaki, and Dr. Mark Lindbergh. Now, no other nominations were received by the board. As such, in accordance with the corporation's bylaws, nominations for directors have been closed, and the individuals as previously named are those up for election as directors by the company's shareholders. There are several key points I'd like to share with you as it relates to <coughs> shareholder voting. Number one, if you prepare and return to proxy, shares will be cast as provided in that proxy. Two, shareholders in attendance today who have not returned a proxy should have received a ballot upon registration. You will be asked to cast your ballot and present those to our ballot clerk. I don't believe that has occurred. <clears throat> Number three, Voting will remain open until 3 o'clock p.m. Central Standard Time. Shareholders who submitted a proxy may vote by ballot, however. If, if you are doing so, you will be required to do so in accordance with the provisions outlined in the June 16th, 2020 uh, letter to uh, all you shareholders. Those provisions require the shareholder to contact our corporate secretary to receive a ballot and then submit the ballot via electronic means by the deadline. I don't believe we had any of those, did we? Not yet. Okay, not yet, because we will be open till three o'clock. <clears throat> the election of the director's voting results are as follows. Proxy voting in favor of the three nominees, 353,000 451 votes for those three nominees. There was a withholding authority to vote for all three nominees by 3,000 votes. And there was a withholding authority to vote for individual an individual nominee, 8,263. <clears throat> and recognition, 
the number of shares cast via proxy and in person on the matter of the election of directors as just announced. I recognize that the three nominees have received a sufficient number of votes in favor of their elect election as directors of this corporation. I would there, therefore declare them duly elected subject to the 3 p.m. closure for all voting and confirmation by the corporate secretary. Are there any questions? The next order of business will be for the same proxy arrangement for next year's annual meeting. I would entertain a motion. So moved. Ken Reiser moves for the same proxy arrangement for next year's annual uh, meeting. Is there a second to that motion? Al Laufer seconds it. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? None to the contrary. Motion carried. <clears throat> Are there any final questions and comments that you shareholders would like to make? Having, <clears throat> having concluded all business that was so properly, do us to properly come before this annual meeting, we will end our electronic and in-person activities. This meeting will automatically adjourn at 3 p.m. this afternoon. I would like to make a few comments as it relates to the board and uh, our surveillance. Uh, <clears throat> not only has um, the um, staff worked extremely hard, all members of the staff from the bottom up to the top. Uh, the virus obviously has been part of that. They've done an outstanding job to keep this bank going, allowing the customers to come in, et cetera. Uh, an outstanding job has been done on the lending side. Uh, and you, you wouldn't have, banks make money by lending. We all know that. And they've, they've, they've done some, an outstanding job. Uh, Increased staff, high-class professional staff, has uh, certainly brought this bank uh, a, a long, long ways. And um, I'm sure that we as stockholders expect that to uh, continue, but uh, it uh, is not, I want you to realize it is not without effort. It is not without effort, a great deal of effort. <clears throat> So I'd like to thank you shareholders for the continued support that you've given uh, First National. First National, I knew I was gonna do that. <laughs> I knew I was gonna do that. <laughs> yeah, I guess that's <clears throat> 60 years of saying that, I'm entitled to it <laughs> once. <clears throat> but uh, uh, they certainly uh, have come a, a, a long way and uh, we appreciate your patronage of Forte both uh, in the uh, banking area and in the investment area. And uh, we, uh, we as shareholders, of course, uh, uh, benefit from not only our friends being customers and shareholders perhaps, but all of us being good customers and shareholders. So uh, given that, uh, I will uh, uh, entertain a motion to adjourn this meeting. No, we're not adjourning. Three o'clock. Before you do that, we do have a thank you from the attendees remotely. David Carroll would like to thank the chairman, who is also his father, <laughs> for over 60 years in the banking industry. <laughs>